Susie Gage and I'm an epidemiologist and psychologist at the University of Liverpool. What I'm really interested in is trying to understand the associations between substance use and mental health. So my superhero is kind of me I suppose but um, what I really want to be able to do is have the ability to be able to see patterns in what looks like random data. So I guess my superpower is, yeah, this ability to be able to see the patterns that maybe other people don't see. It's so a lot of my job I spend looking at spreadsheets of ones and zeros and then turning that into like a beautiful graph or something. So that's kind of taking what looks quite like arbitrary random noise and finding the patterns hidden within it. So that's kind of my superpower. But I, there's a super villain who I'm up against, which is this idea that um, when we're looking at something like substance use, the people who choose to use cannabis are going to be different from the people who choose not to use cannabis in lots of ways other than just their cannabis use. And these are confounders. And when you just observe what people do, it's really difficult to take these into account. So in a, what you'd really want to do scientifically would be to uh, randomly assign a group of teenagers to use cannabis, a group of teenagers to not use cannabis and follow them up and see what happens. But obviously ethics committees don't really go for that for some reason. So what we do is we just watch what people choose to do and then we have to take account for these confounders. But they can potentially be messing up. The associations that we've seen could be all due to, say, whether you've had a difficult time in childhood. That could both predict your likelihood to have later mental health problems and your likelihood to use recreational drugs. So we need to try and take all these things into account, but they're really, it's really difficult to do because A, we have to know about them, and B, we have to measure them well. And both of those things are quite difficult to do. You need to explore it first of all. So this could mean plotting graphs, it could mean sort of just even just looking at the mean and the variance and this kind of thing. Like how how different are different people in your data set? Is everyone roughly around 10 of whatever this value is or do some people have minus 20 and other people have 2000? So just working out what your data looks like and plotting it on a graph is a really good starting point for that. Just getting a visual idea of what these ones and zeros actually mean. Um, a lot of the work that I've done to date has used this incredible data set called Children of the 90s or the Avon Longitudinal Study of Parents and Children to give it its sort of official scientific title. And this is an amazing resource that we've got in Bristol uh, where I used to work before I moved to Liverpool. And it's every woman in what used to be called Avon, which is basically Bristol and the surrounding area, who was pregnant between 1990 and 1991 was invited to take part. And about 14,000 amazing women said yes. And them and their children have been followed up ever since. So we've got behavioral measures, we've got questionnaires, we've got interviews. Somewhere in Somerset, there's a barn full of placentas from those pregnancies. Uh, about 8,000 of the children and similar number of the mums have had their genotype sequenced. So it's an incredibly, incredibly rich data source. But obviously we take the idea of confidentiality and anonymity really seriously. So even though it's just a, just a set of ones and zeros, we can't do anything that might um, allow people to be identified from their data because they've done an incredible thing by giving us all this information. So it's really important that we respect that. So it's definitely needed to be an imaginary data set for this plan.